they believe that because they're paying their contractors a fixed price lump sum for undertaking, for example, the, all the mechanical work on their STO, um, that they don't need to plan or job step each work order. They don't believe that they need to uh, determine the cost. Welcome back to another episode of Digital Innovation and Gas with me, Jeffrey. And on today's episode, we're going to dig into uh, two topics. Uh, the principal one is a area or aspect of the oil and gas industry. In fact, all heavy industry really it goes through periodic uh, stages of what are called shutdowns, turnarounds, and outages. Some, most of the time, you hope these are planned. Sometimes they're not planned. Coming hurricanes will knock a platform off kilter. Uh, and uh, we'll go out, uh, but we have to. Uh, there is a process that our industry goes through to uh, do this in a in a, a professional and managed fashion, so that uh, accumulated pipes do get carried out during the outage. And the outage is re time time of the outage is reduced to as low as possible, because after all, this infrastructure doesn't make any money when it's not actually running. So that's the goal. And uh, a number of companies specialize in providing the services of this uh, in this area, but not as many specialized in providing the technology to make it as efficient as possible. Uh, but today I'm very pleased to bring on to the podcast uh, Ross Kuhlman, who is a, a CEO of a company called I Am Tech, uh, based in the UK. And uh, Ross has been in this field for a, a, he claims a very long time for a guy who looks pretty young, uh, <laughs> quite some time. Uh, and uh, recently published a paper on lessons learned in this whole field. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Ross, welcome uh, to Digital Innovations in Oil and Gas. Hi, Jeffrey. Pleased to be with you. Uh, now, let's begin, first of all, uh, where exactly in the UK are you today? Um, so we call this place Sunny Teesside. Um, it's actually, our offices are based in a county called North Yorkshire, so it's equidistant between Leeds and Newcastle. Ah. Um, so it's in the northeast of the UK. Um, and it's actually quicker to get to Schiphol in Holland than it is <laughs> to Heathrow in London. Oh, um, yeah. Quick flight down, I suppose. Yeah. I yeah. Uh, of cycling from Land's End to John O'Groats in 2012, which if you're from the UK, heads nod and go, yep, that's a big ride. That's a serious ride. How long did that take? Uh, nine days. So we're doing uh, minimum 100 miles per day. And it's yeah. about 1,000 miles all told. And if you get lost, it's a little longer. <laughs> so we, we, we did get lost once. I did the lazy option a few years ago, uh, the coast to coast. So that was just going across the width as opposed to the... Into the veg, yeah, it's quite, it is quite yeah, a see. ride. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, if you don't mind, perhaps you could share a bit of your personal professional background so that we can set a bit of a context here for this discussion. Sure. So in the mid-1990s, I started work for Imperial Chemical Industries, so ICI. Um, and uh, that wasn't by choice. Um, I was actually a media uh, production graduate. I had aspirations of being in TV or in the movie industry, not in front of the camera, not, not pretty enough, but behind it. Right. Um, and um, so I went there as a summer job um, in my last year of university or college, as you guys call it, and um, uh, never left. <laughs> so um, I went and worked in a shutdown turnaround village. Um, and I went there uh, as what they called a technical clerk. Uh, and so I, I was responsible for largely document management. Um, I played with a photocopier a lot. Um, <laughs> I went into a space where there were 400 men. There wasn't a single lady in the shutdown village, yeah. um, uh, other than the calendars on the walls. Um, and um, there was one 486 desk. PC in the corner of the office uh, premises uh, and that makes it sound grand they were really a collection of a dozen park cabins all glued together yeah. um, uh, and they weren't blast proof as they should be in this day and age uh, so if there was an incident we were all gone um, and I asked uh, being a bright fresh-faced uh, graduate what's that to use for 
And they said, sometimes we have to order materials from our warehouses uh, or our uh, store rooms using that computer. But other than that, none of us like to touch it. <laughs> and in the first six months, I saw us waste millions of pounds uh, collecting information during the life of a project and then um, uh, losing a lot of it at the end of the project, registering some of it, putting it away in a registry where you may go and retrieve it in the future. But largely a lot of the information um, uh, was badly logged or lost forevermore. And then whether it was six months to six years later, we would undertake similar or the same projects on the same equipment and start again, building all the same sets of drawings um, and documents is madness <laughs> i just come from a college where i was forced to live on about 50 dollars a week and i felt that we were wasting lots of money um and i said we could do better than this if you let me uh fire up that thing in the corner that you're all scared of yeah and that the journey started nearly uh 30 years ago <laughs> reminds me of a, a time uh similar for me i was working in an oil refinery and uh, was watching the amount of waste uh, taking place, and you know when you're when you're uh, deep in this industry, uh, the scale of things you lose sight of uh, the you know the, the real true context because the scale is just so gigantic, uh, and uh, and uh, hence creates the challenges. So yeah, I also think the margins were different. I think that we had to be less. Oh, sorry, we could have <laughs> rightly or wrongly. There was a perception we could afford to be more inefficient um, because uh, we were at the, the source of energy. Um, and at the time, um, there was less uh, external factors um, that drove efficiency. So, um, but that's all changed over the last 30 years. Changed dramatically, and and in some basins, I'll take the North Sea as an example. Given that you're um, you're based in the UK, the North Sea basin is uh, in a structural uh, decline. There's lots of uh, platforms that are are uh, scheduled to be mothballed, uh, and and so the you know the the industry struggles with with this. Now they're not going to talk about uh, sh that that uh, focus today abandonment, but let's talk about uh, shutdowns, turnarounds, and outages. What if you could just uh, characterize, uh, you know, the current state of the industry when it comes to uh, STO? Uh, um, we're privileged. We've got customers uh, as far away as Australia, uh, Thailand, um, India, the Middle East, uh, across Europe, uh, in Turkey, uh, mainland Europe, um, the UK, uh, and in the US. And it's not the same the world over in terms of mindset, uh, neither approach to how they uh, scope, plan, schedule and execute work. Um, and uh, so we see uh, different practices depending largely on geography or uh, maturity where they are in their um, life of industry. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, uh, and it's not as obvious as you think. So, for example, um, uh, if you'd asked me even 10 years ago, um, would we have thought that India was as advanced or the equal of Europe? Um, I would have uh, said probably not. Yeah, I would have, I would but have that. But having worked with Indian companies over the last few years, I think they're fantastic their head in their maturity, they've not just caught up, they've accelerated past the attitudes and approaches of organisations headquartered in Europe. And how do you explain that? What's behind that? I think, uh, uh, well, I, I, um, probably that they are the superpower and we all don't realise it. They've got the largest middle class yep. and so they've had an abundance of resource. The more people you've got, the more uh, uh, money moving around. Uh, and I think that that's enabled them to um, uh, progress quickly. In addition, they've got uh, the rest of the world to learn from in terms of learning from mistakes. 
Oh, fair enough. And uh, um, I'd, I'd add into it a highly educated middle class, some of the best yeah. technical universities yeah, in the world. Yeah, fantastic. Yep, yep. A lot of connections Are into you... Silicon Valley, and and uh, so there's you can make you can see how structurally that would play to a, uh, a create an advantage um, in in STO. That's fascinating. We get a lot of customers where um, I know. I'm very careful, and please uh, t uh, <laughs> no tell, <names. laughs> me, uh, tell me off yeah, if I try to say a name. Um, we have lots of customers where they believe that because they're paying their contractors a fixed price lump sum for undertaking, for example, the, all the mechanical work on their STO, um, that they don't need to plan or job step each work order. They don't believe that they need to uh, determine the cost. Um, and I would argue that they should care about both from both a safety sense and a financial. In, the, in terms of safety, I'd like to ensure I'm not having too many people working in the same space at the same time. Um, but uh, even if you are on a fixed price for your contractor, I don't ever understand why they're not interested in knowing the plan's achievable. Um, and they argue that, well, labour is uh, less expensive in certain parts of the world, and therefore we can just get more of it and we'll uh, beat the clock. <laughs> and I'm like, well, if my, uh, even if my uh, production income was 100k a day, let alone a million dollars a day, um, I would like to know that the machines aren't going to be off for an hour longer than the um, the planned period of downtime. Yeah. Um, yeah, they don't seem to care as much about that. They think that they'll just throw more labor at it during the execution of their event and that it will be okay. Well, I, and I, in my head, the more planning you do yeah. uh, and the more effort you put into the planning, it may seem costly at the time, the better the outcome. Yeah. I, it's been my certainly my experience that a uh, in Canada the Canadian economy, as you know, is tightly coupled to the U.S. The Canadian dollar trades at a discount to the U.S. dollar, and uh, and labor on an hourly basis uh, is lower has been in some some periods less than the same labor dollar in the United States, and so the the natural management inclination is to say, well, I'll take advantage of those those arbitrages, currency. Um, and uh, labor, uh, dollar per hour labor, and just throw more labor at my problem. And and th th there's a fallacy there. You know, it, it's not. Yeah. It doesn't work out that way uh, neatly. No. no, no. And when you're up against it, you know, uh, you might be able to afford the additional labor, but can you assure what we see um, in Australia? This is very prevalent. Uh, they had more stringent. Uh, responses to, for example, uh, the pandemic, yep. uh, that's then uh, reduced their uh, labour capacity in their country. And now, even if they wanted to pay for more labour, they would struggle to find it. There is a finite pool uh, currently in their uh, uh, land parcel uh, for uh, that they can access. And yeah. they all seem to be fighting over the same labour pool. Yeah. Yeah, um, I used to joke people chose not to live there any longer. <laughs> yeah, I used to joke that uh, the, in Australia, the the practice amongst the major companies to simply hand the vacancies around to each other. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you can't yes. find the body to fill the. Uh, the smart the, uh, contractors, what we're seeing, the smarter contractors that we've worked with, um, actually collaborate with their competitor, ah. so that they can uh, share their knowledge about the resources and try to not uh, cause each other an issue with yeah. um, a manpower shortage. Yeah. Um, and because at the moment, that's probably the smart thing to do, even though it seems counterintuitive to to be talking to your competitor about your headcount and what resources you can access. Yeah. Um, yeah. But again, it's back to the challenge, right? If you know the outcome is going to be uh, uh, poaching each other's staff for marginal dollar increases and you know, all your costs just get out of whack, then suddenly yeah. it's a, the whole thing falls over. Now, you, you've yeah. mentioned uh, 
uh, prior to this, that you had recently uh, carried out some extensive research into best practices and lessons learned uh, that's uh, culminated into an interesting paper uh, on uh, from the from the experience. And I know that you've taken it uh, globally. Can you share some of the uh, you know what's what's the background to the paper, and then maybe we'll get into some of the insights that it's it's surfaced. Sure. So we've been really lucky. Um, well, part the part hard work. Um, <laughs> Uh, luckiest hard worker in the world. Uh, now, um, uh, uh, having ever since dusting off that 486 PC that I mentioned earlier, uh, personally probably been involved now uh, well in excess of 100 large IT projects yeah. in that nearly three decades. Um, uh, some of them with wide geographical footprints. So you're trying to service a similar need in the same organization, but they have different uh, drivers. Um, uh, and you might learn that it's not actually achievable to have uh, one way of working in an organization because in South America, they uh, work differently to maybe Europe yeah. um, as an example. Uh -huh. um, so uh, it's specifically for STOs, we, uh, as an organization, IM Tech's delivered over 30 STO software projects. We have other products, um, and that's where you get to over 100 IT projects. Uh -huh. The lessons learned are um, real-world uh, things that we've discovered on that journey over that time. Um, so there's uh, 25 uh, lessons learned. Uh, we actually have a document for that. Um, and when we present the white paper on the conference circuit, uh, I talk about uh, five of them because uh, often you're only afforded 15 to 30 minutes at most. You don't get this kind of long form conversation, uh -huh. uh, which I prefer. Um, and um, uh, so I talk about the, the top five. And I think they're applicable not just to an STO software project. I think they're applicable to any technology adoption project. Mm. Um, so, uh, if you'd like, I could share uh, the top five now. Yeah, I'm very, uh, I'm I think very I've interested. got them committed to memory after all yeah. this time. <laughs> yeah, um, I'd be very, I'd be very interested. I mean, there is, I can imagine um, that you've you've hinted at some of them already. Uh, I suspect, um, but yes, by all means, uh, uh, what would what would you characterize as the uh, as as the top five? Well, uh, not in necessarily in priority order, but certainly yeah. these are the top five for me that would um, assure success uh, and successful adoption of any technology if adhered to, um, or certainly tremendously increase the likelihood of success. Yeah. Um, so number one is speaking the same language. And I don't mean um, whether I speak French and you speak Italian yeah. and we agree on English, uh, as the intermediary bridge. Um, I mean that we understand each other's terminology. So whether it's uh, safe systems of work and looking at job safety assessments, permits, uh, energy isolation, whether it's shutdowns, turnarounds and outages, I believe that you will have a better outcome if the vendor and the uh, stakeholders, by stakeholders I mean representation across the software's end user community if you share a glossary of terms <laughs> so you might order a job yeah i might call it a jtd yeah uh, which is an acronym for uh, a job technical detail sheet yeah we're all talking about the same thing but we've just heard three different terms yes. no one's right or wrong but let's agree a common language and so whenever we conduct a project we ensure that we understand each other's terminology. And we do that simply with a glossary. And that glossary can hold all three or four or five or half a dozen words that we use to describe the same thing, but we have a definition of that thing. And then we know that we're all talking about the same thing and it prevents confusion. Yeah. And so that's what we mean by all speak the same language. That's number one. Can I, can I just pause you right there? How do you, how sure. do you land on the one term that will prevail uh, because the well or do you well for, yeah so yeah fair enough you could have a a, a a death by committee you could have an arm wrestling competition <laughs> now luckily for us the customer's always right 
so the as a vendor the customer gets to drive which word they wish to use and in our product we actually then configure it so that those are the words or the terminology throughout our uh, user interfaces in the software products themselves because then that helps with the uptake because in the product yeah. actually seeing the terminology you might have been using on a site for the last 20 years yeah um, and that really helps with the adoption yeah um, but I've, I, in, I know in the uh, construction there's a little, little tangent but on the construction side the engineering procurement construction firms because they go from customer to customer project to project they bring their own terminology and language and they don't they don't want to vary from that even though that that's consistent with the customer's world. Yeah. And then the customer's got to live with this for the next 30 years. Uh, so your your perspective is, no, land on a, the glossary of terminology that's specific to the customer's setting and then embrace that uh, terminology with gusto. And, yes, which means uh, absolutely. Change, change, the, change the software so that it reflects the yeah, customer's change, and, and And that cannot be a code change yeah. because if it is, then it's no longer a product. It's a custom solution. And that isn't scalable if you're a software vendor. We learned that lesson uh, over 15 years ago, mm -hmm. um, that it must be configurable or uh, you cannot have one code base across many, many clients all over the world. Um, mm -hmm. all right. uh, but you don't see that with your larger vendors. Um, so with the likes of SAP, uh, for example, or Maximo uh, uh, or uh, Primavera, if that's your preferred scheduling tool, they don't do that. Yeah. So now you've all got to put up with this language that you don't like using and get confused about forevermore. Yeah. Um, and that, that doesn't seem right uh, in this day and age, yeah. that they can't uh, move. It's almost like they feel they're too big to move. Yeah. Um, yeah, I definitely see that. All right, number two. Number two, you want a common, and this actually, parts of this so that I'll be very specific. I'll pause on each one. You want a common, agreed vision coupled with strong leadership. So the three parts are the common, agreed and strong yeah. leadership. Right. Um, so uh, if you can't articulate a clear vision at the beginning of every meeting in less than 20 seconds, uh, it's too complicated. <laughs> So uh, we did a project, you mentioned DPCs a minute ago. Uh, we were still doing a, a long uh, serving project uh, as they grow through acquisition. Um, but we started this project uh, some six years ago uh, with an EPC. Um, and their vision uh, is the in-shift initiative. They boiled it down to that simplicity. And what they meant by the InShift initiative was that they wanted to understand their productivity and earned value in shift. Mm. And by that, whether the shift's eight hours or 12 hours, they wanted to understand uh, the uh, where they are in the productivity of all the work orders, whether uh, nationally, site level, right down to a single job. Um, and they wanted to understand the earned value and they wanted that picture that they were being presented with to be current within the same shift. And that's what they mean by in shift. And they called that the in shift initiative. Hmm. We coupled that with uh, graphics that we presented at the beginning of every meeting that explained what was in it for the uh, uh, customer organization and for their employees, because if you don't the company and the individuals you will have a less effective change management yeah um and so that's a great example of how it works in terms of having a clear vision i think i've been able to describe that uh, reasonably clearly mm -hmm. and i should be able to because i probably said it a hundred times in various meetings with uh, members of their stakeholder groups of the years um but I did mention a third part, and that is that it must be coupled with strong leadership. So I'll give you an example in reverse that isn't strong leadership, help define what strong leadership <laughs> is. Yeah. Um, we worked with another uh, large energy company and they had a clear vision. Their vision was to have a one way of working for STOs across all of their assets, and they have lots of them all over the world. Um, 
that is a clear vision. That's brilliant, right? Yeah, uh, we're all one going way to of working. Scope, plan, yep. schedule, and mm. execute, and yep. lessons learned, and STO the same way. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. And they even accepted that there might be a ten percent difference in the business process at each site for local or regional variation, right? Because you it, utopia if yeah. everyone did exactly the same way everywhere in the world. Up, okay, great. So they had a clear vision, ticking the box. You'd go to every meeting, and you would be faced with half the audience saying we want one way of working and the other half saying we just want market standard we want whatever the product says we don't want to come up with a management procedure first and then try to find or create a piece of software that aligns to the vision <laughs> want to do whatever the product says and have it out of the box yeah and the leaders within the customer organization weren't strong enough to vote one way or the other, because they had the right to change the vision. They could have said, we want off the shelf vanilla product. Yeah. And we'll write a management procedure to align to that. Um, uh, they could have done that, um, but they didn't. They didn't do either. They would just allow their colleagues to argue amongst themselves. And that made that project uh, very cumbersome. Yeah. I can absolutely see that the uh, the idea of a um, uh, and some might some might listen to that story and go, well, hang on a second, uh, one way of working and out of the box actually is the same thing, but it, it is not. Be. It could be. It, it, it but could it is be. Not. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because when what they meant by one way of working is us let us agree our to uh, be business process. Mm -hmm. um, and let's take it was an opportunity. It was an opportunity to uh, um, gather the experiences of representation from sites all over the world and let them feed into what could have been a fantastic outcome. Yeah. And that actually leads us on to the third uh, lesson. It's as almost as though I scripted it and I promised I didn't. <laughs> um, but and that is to involve the stakeholders. So that's not necessary because we have very large user communities. You know, we have one customer with 9,000 end users. You can't get them all on a Teams call, let alone in a room. It would yeah. be inefficient. Mm -hmm. um, however, there's probably 14 uh, job titles or roles represented within those 9,000 people. So as a minimum, we want one representation. So we want one supervisor. We want one scheduler. We want yeah. one planner. We want one uh, site director. We want one maintenance director and so forth. Um, you want to involve those people in the decision making process and the definition of your requirements from the get go. They should be part of the market analysis of whatever software product you're going out and buying. Mm -hmm. Not just because that will improve the selection of whatever technology you adopt, but also because um, when they come to use it, they will feel invested. Yeah. And they will be your champions across your organization and assure that um, that the uptake from the rest of the audience that couldn't be on the team calls, couldn't be in the meetings, uh, they will uh, uh filter that down through the organization and encourage others. Yeah. In reverse, what we often see is organizations involving the stakeholders after you've bought the software. Yeah, too and late. they come along and they say, you're meant to use this. And these people go, well, this isn't even fit for purpose. Yeah. Or this isn't going to work for us. Even though the product might be fit for purpose, might work, they're not even prepared to entertain yeah. an evaluation of it and why should they? Because the first time they're being shown it is during training. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's too late. It's already gone live. Yeah. I call it a kind of inoculation effect. It's as if you've inoculated uh, your organization against a successful deployment because you injected the uh, the workforce with a it, negative view about the, the whole experience and it's just rejected out of hand. So correct. yeah, very challenging. Right. So there's, there's three. Uh, number four. Yeah, well, but back to that third one, we see it all the time also. Organisations think we've gone out, we've picked something, we've spent a lot of money. That's it. Success, it will be fine. 
once the product's gone live, really you just turn it on. It's like a TV. Yeah. It'll be it'll have an instant benefit. No, no, if people don't use it, trust me, it won't get you any results. Yeah. For <laughs> it's a four eight six computer sitting in the corner. Exactly. It's back to that. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, it's a great tool, but if you don't use it, yeah, um, okay. and don't use it properly or well, then yeah. Number four. Yeah, number four. Number four, stakeholders. So it's still relating to stakeholders. Um, mm -hmm. You must afford them the time from their day job and empower them to make decisions. So let me give you an example. We did a project in South Africa uh, for a large uh, EPC. Uh, they're, they're headquartered in Canada, um, but I'm not going to name the name, I promise. <laughs> um, but the project was in South Africa. We were presented with a turnaround manager with uh, nearly 20 years experience as our champion, as our key project manager. Yeah. Um, he was fantastic. He had all the necessary knowledge and experience. He was a very smart gentleman, but he was working 60 plus hours a week, moving between two uh, events uh, across the country of yeah. South Africa. Yeah. Uh, so he didn't have the time uh, to run our project and contribute to our implementation uh, yes. meetings, for example. Yes. He also wasn't empowered. So when, for example, they were agreeing their uh, scheduling definition, what resource codes they needed, simple things, really, uh, at the end of the day, uh, resource codes um, uh, and who would be responsible for capturing progress and things like that, and whether that would be in our tool or in Primavera and so forth, mm -hmm. he wasn't allowed to decide either because Ouch. his boss hadn't empowered him to make those choices. So then whenever there was a key choice to make, he had to go and ask yep. someone else. Time so out. there was a delay. Time out. I so got to go, go talk yeah, to the boss. Exactly. So there was double delay. Yeah. It was one, you might not get him in a given week, or you'd get him for 15 minutes when you needed him for an hour and a half. Yeah. Or he had to go and ask a question of someone else, and they were on holiday, or they were too busy with things that they deemed more important. I mean, we got the software live, but it probably took eight to ten times longer than it, it could have. Yeah, brutal. Yeah. So yeah. afford them the time away from their day job, yeah. And it isn't forever. It might be for three or six months. Say, let's look at your responsibilities, your duties. Right. You can still do some of your existing role and responsibility, but we're going to carve out half of it to go and work with this uh, external vendor to uh, help implement the technology. Yeah. And it will be for the next three to four months. Um, and so we're going to get some extra resource in from our existing team. Uh, in our role, in the customer sure. organization to yeah. come and help you yeah. uh, do your normal role and responsibility. Yeah. And then give them the right to make choices. Yeah. Yeah. So capacity and empowerment uh, go hand in hand. Yeah. All right. Number five. Absolutely. Number five. five. Number five. Change management. You hear it all the time. Or management yeah. to change. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you, uh, you get it in both both versions. Means uh, roughly the same thing. Um, uh, you must give thought to this, invest time in it, uh, create tools, involve people uh, to facilitate successful adoption uh, of any technology. Uh, I'll tell you how we do it. Uh, happy to give this away to both uh, future customers and other competition, uh, because again, you could follow these steps but if you're not prepared to listen and if you struggle to have uh, sensible conversations, it won't make much difference. Yeah, it won't help. Uh, so how we do it is we map the current way of working. So it doesn't matter whether it's for STOs or uh, safe systems of work. Uh, we'll go into an organization and we're phase one is we're in listening mode. Um, and luckily, I'm uh, rarely leading these. It's uh, uh, my team of lots of consultants who are much better at listing than me. Uh, uh, my chimp brain uh, kicks in. I often try and finish people's sentences before they've said something. So I'm not very good at this. But luckily, I've got some really good people that work for me. 
Um, and so phase one is to listen. And out of that, we capture the current way of working. Because that's how they may have been doing it for a very long time, sometimes decades, yeah. especially with, say, systems of work that have been around since the Second World War uh-huh. um, from the US Navy. So um, we listen, we capture the as is, um, then we go away and we document all of that. Because I tell you what, um, I'd like to say nine times out of ten, maybe it's not that extreme, but the, in the majority of cases, if you ask for a management procedure, or you ask for a process flow diagram for how you uh, currently run your shutdowns, turnarounds, outages, they won't have one. They often claim they have one, but when you ask a client to actually put their hands on it and share it with you, they haven't even got it written down. It's basically the culmination of the knowledge and expertise of the people in their team, and I'm not dismissing that. That's great stuff. But how do you educate others if you haven't actually got it written down? Yeah. So uh, new people that come into your organisation, for example. Anyway, we will document it for them. So even if they don't move forward with technology, at least they've now least they've got, got a process model, a management yeah. procedure, yeah, yeah. Um, and some uh, very accurate process flow diagrams. So that's the as is the current way of working. Then we'll explain to them how our technology can help them improve their ways of working. We have what we call the top thirty benefits. Uh, for each product. We'll then also share with them our other lessons learned. Um, And by that, I don't mean how to make a successful technology adoption project. I mean um, how other working practices relating to either maintenance or safety uh, in other organisations and what's worked for other organisations. So we call this value add. so we're not getting directly reimbursed for this, but if we've worked uh, for other customers, we're always uh, very strict with our confidentiality. But if they have a way that's going to make another site safe, I don't see that as a competitive edge. So I don't mind sharing that knowledge and experience of best practices. Yeah. Because um, I've seen uh, close friends, family, et cetera, being injured at work and so forth. I don't want that to happen to others. No. Um, so um, we'll share that best practice. Um, we'll then agree what we're going to do, uh, and we call it the 2B. So this is the new way of working, and we document that. So it's the next iteration of their current way of working, So it's an update to the management procedure and the process flow diagrams. Then we cross-reference the two and we can heat map or spot the differences. That becomes our change index. And whether it's a slide deck that helps explain the difference to someone in a way, in a certain step of how they're going to work, whether it's other tools, Uh, whether it's uh, other job roles we have to create, uh, whatever it may be, we must overcome each one of those differences to help ease the adoption. Yeah. Um, And that's change management for me. Yeah. I actually personally draw a distinction between change management and management of change. Uh, I, I see them as two different things. If you go into a typical energy business and talk about management of change they understand very much what that is that's uh, usually involves hardware it's safety driven i'm going to change my yes. procedures i get that but when you talk about change management helping people embrace a different way of doing work or that that's a almost foreign concept it's still still is a, a yeah. struggle to yeah, kind sorry, of yeah, draw this yeah, thing. sorry when I, earlier when i was being flippant you get people into changing those, and I agree. Yeah. Um, management of change is about the retention of your engineering knowledge, how yes. the plant should be operated safely, for example, yeah. uh, so that you avoid, avoid the likes of uh, the yeah. Gulf incident that BP yeah. had. Yep. If That's they'd understood up. that, then um, and out of that, uh, you know, more management of change systems uh started to appear yeah. uh, shortly after that for good reason yeah um yeah you don't want to uh lose that knowledge no um, ross this has been really interesting uh kind of overview of the of the top five and you said there's a lot more to come 25 in total i think you said yeah where's the paper yeah. is it been released or published 
Uh, no, so we don't give away the full 25 uh, to uh, in the public domain <laughs> yeah. um, because, uh, you know, it's taken my entire working life to get yeah, it's, those together. It's property, not just yeah. mine either. I've got right. colleagues that have been part of the journey with me for nearly 20 years as well. Yeah. Um, and so... So the right way is engage uh, you in a conversation and, and uh, learn some yeah. more. Right. Well, we'll put yeah. in the show yeah, notes. Yeah, we it. If we were yeah. undertaking a project, again, back to yeah. value add, yeah. we're not going to sell someone the top 25. We're going to apply them in what put we do. And put them to work. Yeah. And we live and breathe it. It's part of our culture. We have very strong values, yeah. um, uh, which we're uh, living every in every interaction. Yeah. Ross, it's been an excellent discussion on uh, the uh, uh, STO landscape as well as the uh, lessons of, of uh, successful deployment of change in these organizations. Thank you very much for coming on the podcast today. No, thank you for having me, Jeffrey. Much appreciated. Yeah. This has been another episode of Digital Innovations in Oil and Gas. If you like what you've heard, please press the like button. Better yet, leave a comment and uh, share this with your network so others can hear uh, this episode, and I'll return shortly with another. Bye for now.